I'm one of the attorneys at OMAG, but I'm also the claims director. And so forgive me because you're about to get into my wheelhouse where I can geek out with the best of them when it comes to the wonderful world, world of tort claims. So any discussion on tort claims, we're gonna have to start with the basic reality, uh, legal reality that it's good to be the king. We are considered to be sovereign governments. We take that concept of sovereignty from our ancient days of being associated with England, who of course their idea of sovereignty was the king is king because God said so. <clears throat> we don't work that way. That was kind of a problem for us. So we you know, didn't like that. So we moved on from them, but we kept certain concepts, including the concept of sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity is basically the concept that you don't get to sue the king unless the king says so. You don't get to sue the government unless the government agrees to be sued, consents to be sued. Now, the reality is that the government in America is supposed to be democratic, supposed to be accountable to its citizens. We have mistakes that cause citizens to lose things. And so you don't get very far in a political career if you tell citizens to piss off. So you're going to have to provide some form of consent to be sued. Now, in the early years of the state, we had this weird dichotomy of when we could be sued because we do things that are governmental. We do things like police that really, you can't do police unless you're the government. We also do things that the court called proprietary or business. We sell water. Well, you don't have to be the government to sell water, except that the government won't let you do it if you're infringing on their ability to do it. We sell utilities. We, we do business type activities. And so early on, our state viewed that, well, when you act as the government, you can't get sued, but when you act as a business type function, you can get sued. Well, all that went away in the 70s when our Supreme Court said this makes no sense because the lines between governmental and proprietary really kind of blurred and overlapping. We're done with this. We're gonna have a consent to be sued and we're gonna let the legislature take care of it, but you gotta get rid of this dichotomy between governmental and proprietary. That's how we get after Vanderpool to something you've heard of, the Governmental Tort Claims Act. Governmental Tort Claims Act is the way you get to sue the government. It's the manner, procedural mechanism to obtain the consent of the government to be sued. It is considered what is called a limited waiver of our sovereign immunity, which those limits are procedural. They're also substantive. It all starts with the filing of a tort claim. Tort claim has to be filed with the city clerk has to be filed with the city clerk within one year and in writing. Now, notice in writing, the reason it says in writing is because before they actually amended it to say that, our Supreme Court said, well, it just says that the claim has to be presented to the clerk coming in and saying, I've got a claim with you. Yeah, that probably suffices. Okay, we'll fix this. The legislature says it has to be in writing. Cool. With the city clerk, well, it used to say the city and so the Supreme Court said, well, actually talking with the city attorney and telling them you have a claim, that probably suffices. Okay, city clerk. Okay, we're good. Filed with. It says filed with, not addressed to, not handed to. It says it has to be filed with the clerk. What that means is if it gets sent to the city manager, it has not been filed with the clerk, but when, what are you going to do as manager? You're probably going to bring it down to the clerk and hand it to the clerk. Well, at that point in time, it's been filed with the city clerk. So it doesn't technically require that it be addressed to the clerk. It could be just addressed to the city. It doesn't require that it be handed to the clerk. It requires that it get to the clerk. So occasionally we tell everybody you cannot file tort claims directly with us. You have to file it with the city clerk. Depending on the circumstances, sometimes we'll call the clerk and say, do you want us to send you a copy so that we can just cut past this step and just start moving on? Half the time they say yes. So we file it with the clerk for them. We try and tell them, though, please don't file it with us. Send it to the city clerk. Follow the process. They'll get it to us, I promise. All it requires, though, is that it be filed with the clerk. You have sovereign immunity before a tort claim is filed. You have sovereign immunity after a tort claim is filed for 90 days. You retain your sovereign immunity for 90 days after a tort claim is filed. And then after that is when you, they can actually obtain your consent to be sued, which you didn't know you were consenting, but you did. A tort claim has to include certain kinds of information, like who the claim is against. Now that seems kind of obvious if they're giving it to you that the claim is probably against the city. We've had cities and towns that have sent us stuff that were meant for the county and, and on its face says this is meant, you know, we're filing this with the Muskogee County the Board of County Commissioners. Then why'd you give it to the city clerk of the city of Muskogee? 
We, we've had that happen. We've had people send it to the wrong place. The tort claim has to say which entity is involved or entities. We've had multi-entity claims all the time. Has to say date, time, location of when they suffered something or they think they suffered something. Has to say what the circumstances are. What happened to you? Why do you think you have a claim? has to give us the name, address, and phone number of both the claimant and if they have what the, it calls a settlement agent, which is nice wordage for, wording for a plaintiff's attorney, they have to provide name, address, and phone number of their uh, agent as well. And they have to give us Medicare reporting information, which is basically social security and date of birth, and if they're Medicare, a whole bunch of other complicated stuff. We have some city clerks who will tell a claimant who brings in the tort claim, uh, we can't accept that because we need, it's an auto accident, we need three estimates from, from you to accept your tort claim. No, you don't. You have to accept the claim. Whether it's defective or not, let us take care of that, but you can't refuse the claim when they present it. And in fact, the statute says it has to have all this information. And then the next sentence is, but if it doesn't include almost everything that is listed there, that's okay. It doesn't have to include almost everything that's listed there because we have the right to ask for it. And if they don't give it to us, then there's a problem. But essentially the only thing it has to say is their name, address, and phone number, their attorney's name, address, and phone number, if there's an attorney, and which entity is involved. It doesn't have to say the date, time, location. It doesn't have to say the circumstances. They can file a bare bone claim and still be technically compliant because the statute says we have the right to ask. And if we ask and they don't respond, then it invalidates it. So don't let your clerk turn somebody away because they didn't bring an estimate. They don't have to. It would be nice if they did. It will help move things along, but we can't refuse the claim. We will run into this issue where usually when attorneys get involved, where tort claim gets filed and that wasn't good enough, so here's another tort claim and here's another tort claim. There are some actual rules when it comes to whether or not you can actually successfully file a second tort claim. In the Grider case, the people filed a tort claim on their own, got denied, the statute ran, and right before the one year ran, an attorney filed a tort claim for him. And then he later filed suit. It was the exact same issue they filed a tort claim on. And the Supreme Court said, or the Court of Civil Appeal said, you, you file it once. You get one bite at the apple. If you filed it, they didn't pay it, and you don't sue, you can't revive your claim by filing a second tort claim on the exact same thing. You only get to file it once. However, in the Kennedy case, the court did note that, look, there are different people that may have suffered a loss, and there are different kind of losses. You can only file a tort, tort claim once for a particular kind of loss, but if you didn't include another loss from the incident, then yeah, you can actually file, file a follow-up tort claim. Kennedy involved a sanitary sewer overflow, or what we call poo in the house, which is one of our biggest claims, frankly. Burl Kennedy filed a tort claim for property damage. See, so denied it. Then Burl came back in to file a tort claim for he and his wife and his kids for both property damage and personal injury because they were annoyed and inconvenienced. So we'll get to what all that means and the literal crap that it means for us, thanks to court opinions. And what the court said is, look, yeah, that first tort claim raised property damage for Burl. That timed out and he didn't get suit on file in time for that. But it didn't include the wife and the kids for their non-property damages. It didn't include his own non-property damages. And so yeah, that second claim actually raised new losses and new people. The first one was just him, one particular kind of loss from that incident. There were other kind of losses weren't included. That's where the second tort claim was valid. Now this is a whole bunch of words because the court tried to be really <sighs> complicated. The Grisham case basically stands for this. If you use a tort claim form, which we provide, and it has a place for property damage and non-property damage, and they use your form, and they only put down property, you hear me saying and, 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 they were trying to really narrowly say you can only screw a claimant if these exact things happen. If the city uses a form, it has a place for property and non-property, and they only fill out the property damage part, then they've only invoked the tort claim process for property damage. They haven't invoked it for non-property damage, which would of course mean to invoke that they'd need to file a new claim to raise the non-property damages. And we will see this where maybe the number one attorney and the number two business uh, comes in and somebody already filed a tort claim for property damage, so he'll come in right before the one year and, and will file one on personal injury to try and grab the big money. Um, 
And he can do that because Grisham says, hey, they only raise property damage here. They didn't raise non-property damage because they used the city's form. They didn't check off non-property damages. Sovereign immunity, our ability to say, hey, you can't sue us, that goes away when the claim is denied. The city can deny a claim itself, like it can actually say, no, we don't agree, we deny this. If it doesn't, 90 days after it's filed is deemed denied by statute. If you're gonna express deny, you have to give, give notice in writing within five days to the claimant. We have had several cities where, well, we denied the claim on this date. Cool, send us a copy of the letter. Well, we denied it, it was on the council agenda. Okay, but we need a copy of the letter you sent the claimant. Well, we didn't send him a letter. Well, then you didn't deny the claim. You might have thought you denied the claim, but you, you didn't deny it if you don't send them a letter within five days. Do you have to deny them? We will send you a letter. If we find no liability, we'll send a letter saying we recommend denial. The harsh reality is most of our members do not want to get into that. They don't deny the claims, and I don't blame them because I'm a city attorney as well. I'm not putting tort claims on my agenda again because the only tort claim I've had on my agenda was the guy whose door we kicked in because somebody was in medical distress, and that's the exact address where it was happening, except that it wasn't. It was the house right behind, and the GPS that we had was saying it was in that area, and they gave us clear as day on the audio from the 911 call. They gave us the wrong address, and that's the door we kicked. So OMAG recommended denial. An hour of city council meeting, an hour of my city councilors, not an executive session, but an open session, hemming and hawing on this thing. Guys, what did we do wrong? Well, we didn't do anything wrong. Well, then why would you pay the claim? Well, because we kicked in his door. Okay, we don't pay claims unless we can at least tell the chiefs what they did wrong and what to do different. Well, hand ring, hand ring, hand ring. Finally, one of my Ward 1 Council members, you know, I really wish the guy was here uh, so we could hear from him about this. Oh, well, well, Bo, he, he actually was selling the house at the time. He's, he's moved out of War Acres. He, he doesn't live here anymore. He actually sold the house two weeks after this happened. And I get the death look from Councilman Broadwater. I see, why the hell didn't you tell us that an hour ago? Motion to deny the tort claim. <laughs> oh, so he doesn't live here anymore. And now we don't have to talk about it. But if he lives here, but that's the reality of why people don't like to put tort claims on the agenda because somebody lived in somebody's ward and somebody's ward council member might want to be sympathetic to them. You don't have to put it on your agenda. We don't ask our cities. We'll send you a letter telling you that. We recommend denial just so you know what's going on with the claim. We're not actually saying you must deny this. If you don't want to put it on your agenda, that's fine. You don't have to. The only benefit we get from an express denial, it starts the timelines a little bit quicker. Frankly, it usually takes us about 30 to 45 days to get it fully investigated, depending on how complicated it is. By the time we're sending out the letter, there's not that much time left on the statute. So whether you express denied or not, it's going to make a difference of a few days. So if you don't want to put it on your agenda, I don't blame you. But if you're comfortable doing it, your council is going to take it up professionally and not sympathetically. They're going to look at the actual case itself. Cool. You don't have to. Once that. You just teed me up for one of my favorite jokes, which, which is the, the two criticisms you'll, you'll ever hear about OMAG, damn it, OMAG just pays everything. Damn it, OMAG doesn't pay anything. I, I want to get those people and put them in a room together to, to talk because the reality is we generally pay about a third, 33 to 37% of the tort claims that are filed at the claim stage, which means no attorneys, no nothing. There's about... Oh, any given year, 12% of those claims that, well, that we didn't pay that go to litigation, which means the majority of the claims that we don't pay, we don't settle, they don't sue. We, we investigate them. We pay the ones we owe. This is where if, you were down, if you've met Mr. Tackett, he and I always have a little thing at, at the office. OMAG exists to pay claims. No, Bill. OMAG exists to pay claims our members owe. That's what we're here for. And that's our standing joke that he and I can probably spend an hour up here going back and forth on. So... 
your council would not ever vote to approve to pay claims because that's what we're for. We pay them. If you want, we can send your council a list of every time we pay a claim, but I don't think that's uh, something you want in the cards. Uh, you probably don't want our, us telling your council all the claims we pay. I don't know, Susie, there are a couple of things we might want to tell them the claims that we're paying and why we're paying them. But uh, actually, Susie had a, a fantastic idea several years ago, which, which if you've gotten a nice little letter from us because you got involved in litigation, you might have seen there was a reference in there that if we have a mediation or settlement conference, somebody from the city council needs to attend. And it was so that they would know what was going on. And if we're going to be paying money, especially real money, that they know what's going on. Because it if they don't know, they don't know, and that can be a problem sometimes. So anyways, back to the story. Once claims denied, 108 days. So you got, got to file within one year. Once it's filed, 90 days for us to review. Sovereign immunity is retained during that 90 days. After it's denied by statute or expressly, our waiver kicks in for 180 days. The end of that 180 day period, we get it back. It's like that warm blanket we get back. We've got sovereign immunity back, and their claim is forever barred. They don't file suit within that 180 day window, their claim is barred. It is a limited waiver. And the limits, substantively, depend on if you're talking about damage to property or not damage to property. If it's damaged to property, it is a $25,000 cap. Now, not in the slides, but worth noting, the Code of Civil Procedure says that when you negligently damage somebody's property and you sue them, you can get your attorney fees. That's all subject to the cap. So if we negligently damage somebody's property and it's worth $20,000, they can get $5,000 in attorney fees in the litigation. It also means that if we negligently damage somebody's property and it's worth $1,000, that they could get $24,000 in attorney fees. So it's all subject to the $25,000 cap. And the reason it is, is because it's a balancing test here. It's the legislature balancing, we should compensate people when we wrong them but we can't let things run wild because we only have a limited supply of taxpayer money here. And so we have to balance and say, here's the limits of what is reasonable for us to pay you while not breaking the bank potentially in a given lawsuit. So that's property damage. Personal injury, non-property damages, essentially it's worded as any all other losses, all other non-property damage losses. For just about every, you may hear from Oklahoma City or Tulsa, because if you're not over 300,000 population, it's a $125,000 cap. If over 300,000, it's 175. The difference between property and non-property, you can stack the 125s. It is per claimant and per type of loss. Type of loss, what do I mean by that? If our police falsely arrest somebody for state tort purposes and use excessive force while affecting the arrest, well, those are different claims. There is a loss from being falsely arrested and being in that nice jailbird magazine. There's also a separate loss from getting the crap kicked out of you. Those are separate losses, separate 125 caps. It doesn't mean that if it's, well, you committed the tort of false arrest and you negligently arrested me and you intentionally, you, no matter how many fun words that they come up with and different causes of action in the state, it's all one loss. Doesn't matter how you get there, trespass versus nuisance. It, you get one set of loss, you get one cap. What it also means though is, if we get into an auto accident with somebody and they've got three people in the car, well, we damaged the car, 25, and we've got four people with 125 maximum each. So that's where you can see things stack. The 25, when we push poo up into somebody's house, the fact that you push it into my house, yes, me and my wife live there and own the house, we don't have separate $25,000 caps because we own the property together. So we don't each get a cap. However, if we were renting, our personal property might have been damaged, 25. Their real property might have been damaged, separate 25. That's how these caps end up working is if it's shared property, everybody has the same ownership interest, it's all 125 cap. But when it comes to those non-property damages, everybody gets their own. Everybody gets their own cap. And we're gonna talk about sewer backups here a little bit later that 125 cap is what they have figured out and why they don't care about the property damage anymore. They're going after the non-property damage because it's worth a heck of a lot more money and it's per person. And so there's some gamesmanship going on when it comes to that 125. Yeah. 
So the question was essentially, do you have, and I'm doing this more because we're recording this, so the microphone here wouldn't have picked up what you said. The question was essentially, do you have to have separate claims per, for each person or can it be filed jointly? And, and the best lawyer answer, of course, is always what? It depends. Um, take property damage. You don't have to have both the husband and the wife on the tort claim. It also means that if the husband files a tort claim or the wife files a tort claim, the other one can't then also file a tort claim because common ownership. When you're talking about claims that are personalized though to the individual, it can be filed jointly or it can be filed separately. For example, let's say it was a husband, wife, two kids. Well, you don't need to fill out a separate form for each person. They could do John, Jane, you know, Annie and Andy. They, they could do that if they wanted to. They could also file it separately. They can, in, not in the slides, but worth noting, they can use your form. They don't have to. The forms are provided as a convenience. It, they're not required to fill out the form. So more often than not, if they're, they've got an attorney, they don't even have to be related. If the attorney gets them all signed up as a client, they're just gonna send one letter, except for some of the dumb attorneys, and then they'll send a separate letter for each one of them. Now, the letter's gonna have to include all the information for each of their clients, but it can all be submitted at once. Nice thing, no punitive damages. We are the government. We'll pay you your actuals up to a cap. We're not paying punitive damages. That's prevented by statute. We had a city here a few years ago who hadn't been with OMAG for years and then couldn't figure out why our prices were just so much less than what they were paying for their commercial carrier that they had. And it was because they were overinsured. They are grossly overinsured, like three to four times more than what they needed. And of course they were paying for it and they were paying a commercial carrier, not a governmental entity. The problem with doing that, those torque caps don't apply if you buy insurance that insures you over the limit. If you buy a commercial policy from Travelers that insures you for a million dollars per occurrence, well, now it's a million dollars per occurrence. It's not 25 and 125, it's a total of a million dollars. That's why our policy is worded. We have you for the liability that you're legally obligated to under the law because that's defined by the Tort Claims Act. We don't state in our policy, oh, we're gonna insure you up to this amount. We state, we're gonna insure you up to your legal limit. So if you get insurance, and this is something that we'll tell people, look, if, if we're not the right fit for you, at least make sure the commercial carrier is gonna write it correctly so they don't expose you more than what you need to be exposed for. Because if they do, that's the limit then. And of course, why wouldn't it be? It's not public money at that point. This is basic risk transfer. You don't wanna be insured, cool. You keep your premium money, but you also keep the risk if you get dinged on a lawsuit. Instead, you pay us some certain amount to us, we take the risk. Well, if it's insurance money, it's not taxpayer money, and so the courts essentially look at it and say, yeah, the statute makes sense because the public treasury is not the one paying this. So you get a $300,000 limit instead of a 125, who cares? It's not public money that's paying for it. You paid a premium, it's now insurance money that's paying for it. So that's the logic behind why they say, look, you, you buy more coverage than you need, that coverage controls and not the Tort Claims Act, it actually kind of makes sense because it's no, the Tort Claims Act is about protecting the public treasury while giving an avenue for recovery to the citizens. You, you transfer that to an insurance company that wants to take on more risk, cool. Let them take on more risk is essentially what the court says. Up until a couple of years ago, there was some uncertainty about what happens if you are in a, you know, have somebody in a city vehicle say that's in Kansas or in Arkansas or whatever and they get into an accident. We have very forgiving caps here in Oklahoma. There are a lot of states that do not have tort caps. They have a tort claims act that, because you still have to get that consent to be sued, but they don't cap out liability. And so there's always that concern of, okay, if you're out of state and something happens, are there limits on liability or do we have to follow their tort claims act? Luckily, 2019, the Supreme, US Supreme Court made clear that state cannot bring you into court unless you consent to be sued. Your consent to be sued is under your local tort claims act, which means to get your consent, they have to follow your local tort claims act. What that means, take the complicated, make it less complicated, the tort claims act follows you wherever you go. You go down to Texas to do something, they don't have tort caps, you do, because we can't be sued in Texas unless we agree to be sued. We only agree to be sued if it's on our terms. So the tort claims act now, they've made expressly clear, follows you wherever you go. Which, as I just said, is actually a good thing because our tort caps like actually exist and the other states that have caps are actually tend to be higher than our tort caps. So 
So a tort, I wish, you know, Susie has made sure that every copy of this video has been burned, except Kevin tells me he still has one because they, they've got her on video with Doria do, doing a tort claim question. What is a tort? It sounds like, what was it like? Sounds like a quiche or something like <laughs> that. That's her saying, I'm not doing it again. I'm not doing it again. Uh, a, a tort is essentially what we call a common law remedy. Uh, the, the most of the, you hear negligence, you hear nuisance, trespass. Th those are all things that courts made up hundreds and hundreds of years ago that we continue to follow. They're considered common law remedies. A few years ago, after our state Supreme Court did something a little silly and decided to create a claim that exists outside the Tort Claims Act that was uncapped, the legislature amended the definition of a tort in the Tort Claims Act. It is now broader than the common law and includes claims under the state constitution or state statutes. So now all those claims got brought into the Tort Claims Act. What's not subject to the Tort Claims Act? Well, breach of contract. Your liability doesn't rise in common law or statutes or constitution. It's based on an agreement you had with somebody. Breach of contract's not subject to the protections of the Tort Claims Act. And federal theories, because the federal government doesn't care about our little Tort Claims Act, they, they get to tell us when we can be sued and not sued. So their theories are not subject to the Tort Claims Act. Otherwise, pretty much everything else is. We are liable for actions of our employees, and yes, I'm emphasizing it for a reason, actions of our employees within the scope of their employment. Now, I know you think you know what employee means, but it, for tort claim purposes, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Yes, it does mean all those W-2 little minions you've got running around out there trying to commit torts. It also includes those wonderful five, seven, or nine minions you've got that got elected by the citizens and may or may not get compensation. The Tort Claims Act defines employee as being without regard to compensation, without regard to whether it's a full-time, part-time, seasonal. It's all about, do they have the authority to act on your behalf? That's why governing body members are picked up. It's also why if you have a volunteer event, I remember having a conversation with Jason that he probably wished was about a quarter of the length that it was because they wanted to, they were going to uh, have a, a thing at the park to try and build some playground equipment and what would the city's liability be if there were people that were coming in to volunteer for the city? Well, by volunteering, if they're under our control, doesn't matter if they're paid or not, they become our employees for tort claim purposes. So compensated, uncompensated, that's why your elected officials are covered, volunteer firefighters are covered, unpaid reserves are covered. It's because the Tort Claims Act defines employee as both employees as we understand it and volunteers, elected officials, et cetera. Scope of employment, there's a nice little key part of the definition of scope of employment. Now, most of it, clear, you know, easy to understand. It's performing duties lawfully assigned or tasks lawfully assigned. But the Tort Claims Act requires that they're performing the duties in good faith. An employee is acting within the scope, not just if they're doing their duties, but if they're acting in good faith. By definition, you can be doing your duties, but if you do it maliciously or in bad faith, legally you are not acting within the scope of your employment. At that point, you are outside the scope, which has consequences. Because the Governmental Tort Claims Act readopts sovereign immunity and applies it to all employees and grants them immunity from personal liability so long as they're acting within the scope. Which means so long as they were doing their job or tasks in good faith. If they were, they have full immunity because the limited waiver in the Tort Claims Act only applies to the public entity. So essentially the Tort Claims Act says, okay, city and its employees acting with the scope, they're all immune. We will waive the sovereign immunity for the public entity for torts committed by their employees within the scope of their employment. So that limited waiver only applies to the city, but the immunity protection only applies to the employees if they were within the scope. So employees who act outside the scope, personal liability, no tort caps, punitive damages. And by the way, we, we don't cover it because we can't, because you can't. They can't be liable if they act within the scope, but if they are inside the scope, you can't be liable and you can't pay on a state tort theory. And since we are an extension of you and we're a public entity, means we can't pay. That's the dangerous thing for people who act maliciously or in bad faith. They are by definition left out on the edge with personal liability exposure. reason why I asked that is we had two council members recently um, 
I believe they're acting maliciously and outside of their scope. Um, and I'm not going to say what they did, but so I fired off an email to the entire council. It was one of those where I said, do not respond, you know, because it's Open Meeting Act violation. But I simply told them, hey, we have some new council members, and you may or may not know that you may be personally responsible and liable for your actions. And if you have any questions, either contact the city attorney or contact your own attorney. Um, so, I mean, is that going to be a notice? Or does there even have to be a notice if they're acting outside of their so, and for recording purposes, the question is, do, does the employee have to be notified that they are potentially outside the scope before they can be held liable? The answer is no, they don't have to be notified because whether they acted in bad faith or good faith, acted maliciously or not, usually doesn't depend on whether or not they got a notice. However, it won't help their case if somebody had told them that, hey, you could be outside the scope here if you keep going down this path. A court's still going to look at it and try and figure out, okay, was the person right? That, that they, if they go down this path, they're outside the scope. Honestly, most of the scope of employment issues we deal with with elected officials isn't good faith, bad faith. It's, you know, it's council manager form government and they elected official trying to direct city employees and tell them what to do or investigate employees uh, on their own and do stuff that's not about good faith, bad faith, but that's not, that's legally outside the scope of your duties and the tasks. You cannot do that because the statutes say your role is limited to this. That's where we deal with most of the scope of employment issues. The malicious, non-malicious, bad faith or not, honestly will turn on what the, the lawsuit is about. So take, for example, police officers accused of maliciously prosecuting somebody. Well, by definition, to prove that up, you have to prove malice, which by definition, to prove that as part of the case, means that they you know, are going to be, de by definition, outside the scope. Conversely, take defamation. We had a cop out in Weatherford who got sued personally for defamation his entire defense was whatever I said or didn't say, I was within the scope and I acted in good faith, went to a jury and they agreed. That was the threshold issue. Did he act in good faith before we even get to, did he say something that was libelous to the plaintiff? Jury came back with, yeah, he's acting in good faith within the scope, case closed. So the notice, depending on who it's sent from, like for example, if it came from the city attorney, judges tend to look a little bit more favorably on those kind of things from attorneys than from, from lay people. But it doesn't help their case if they're told, hey, if you continue down this path, you're outside the scope, you could be personally liable. That's not going to help. So not required, but we're going to talk about documentation here in a little bit and you know, when documentation is good, when documentation is bad. I will also tell you, if you're having that issue, we have to walk a tightrope sometimes with elected officials, but we'll walk the tightrope and, and we'll... We, we offer sort of the nice training, you know, having Bill and David Weatherford come out to do governing body training and that, that's sort of the nice stuff. We will also tell cities and sometimes send them something in writing that says, that if this, then sometimes that could be found to be outside the scope. We never want to take a firm position on it because we don't want to put your people in a bad spot. I prefer to be notified on stuff like that because I don't think we need to let you guys know. I mean, obviously you know about now because we're telling you guys, but uh, and that way you guys can issue some sort of a response. What we'll sometimes do is we will sometimes send, send somebody out there. We'll sometimes offer to talk to the council members. At the end of the day, we're not going to want to put something in writing that says you are outside the scope of your employment at this point, because frankly, we're not going to know, because we're not going to know all the facts. And we don't want something from OMAC being used as an exhibit against a city official. I mean, that's just practical realities. We're here to protect the entity. We don't want to put people in jeopardy if we can avoid it. Where it becomes dicey is if they do get sued. Because if they get sued, then we have to decide, are we going to provide a defense? Are we going to provide indemnity to them? State tort, pretty much I send a letter that says, hey, we'll defend you, but by definition, you cannot be held liable unless, and if the unless comes to pass, by definition, we couldn't pay anything. So it's something that I'd be happy to talk to you about and figure out what exactly is going on and what role we might be able to, pay to play to help maybe mend fences or at least get people back working as close to together as possible. Because frankly, about half the time when I've dealt with these, it's been a lack of knowledge. The other half, it hasn't. It, it's been, I'm gonna do what I, I'm gonna do. I don't care what anybody tells me. So. All right. <clears throat> as I said, federal theories are not subject to the Tort Claims Act. What happens when individuals get sued under federal theories? Well, the Tort Claims Act may not dictate liability, but it does say that the public entity has a duty to defend and indemnify its employees, which indemnify, that means pay damages. 
that the public uh, employer has to defend and indemnify employees sued on a federal theory as long as they're acting within the scope. Now, unlike state tort, where you can't get a judgment against a public employee unless the jury finds they acted outside the scope, that's not an issue in federal cases, so it can get a little dicey if there's a judgment against an employee in a federal theory, because then you have to confront the issue of were they legally outside the scope. Sometimes that requires a separate lawsuit, but we have a duty to defend and indemnify. That's what we pick up. We, we pick up that obligation. That's why we provide defense attorneys to cops that are sued in civil rights, and we will offer to indemnify as long as they were acting within the scope. That indemnity obligation, however, is capped. And it's capped at the cap on total liability from a given occurrence of $1 million. So it's not a runaway. You've heard about some of the settlements and judgments in police cases across the uh, United States. In Oklahoma, they can get a judgment for however large they can get a judgment for. Our obligation to indemnify our employees is capped out at $1 million per occurrence. And that's not just OMAC's policy, that is the Tort, Claim Act, Tort Claims Act. So the Tort Claims Act itself is procedural. It's a way to sue the government. It doesn't itself create any theories. It in fact says that the government can be held liable on the same terms as any individual could be held liable, and here's how you get to sue them. If you could otherwise be held liable, there are instances where the Tort Claims Act says, actually, a private person could, but you can't. There are immunities within the Tort Claims Act, 37 of them, some of which are ridiculous and never get used, some of which are not ridiculous and get used all the time. There are 37 exemptions where whether you could ultimately be held liable or not, the, court, the legislature said, we don't get off step one. If it's this kind of loss or caused by this kind of action, the city is immune from liability. For example, well, this wouldn't have happened to me if you would have adopted that ordinance that Councilman Bob proposed, then none of this bad stuff would have happened to me. Well, we're immune from liability from adopting or failure to adopt an ordinance. Our legislative decisions on whether to adopt an ordinance or not are not things we can be held liable for. There's an immunity under the Tort Claims Act. And if we adopt an ordinance and we don't enforce it, failure to enforce the law or ordinances can't be held liable for. Your cop watches a guy going 100 miles an hour down Main Street and they end up plowing into another car. Could they have stopped them and potentially stopped the loss? Maybe. The lawsuit doesn't get off step one because we never started to enforce the law. And failure to enforce the law is not something we can be held liable for. Once we start to enforce the law, we have to not be negligent. But that discretionary call of whether to enforce the law or not, if we, if we don't enforce the law, if we don't start to, Tort Claims Act says we can't be held liable. Discretionary policy decisions. One of the big cases on point was about a fire department not able to put out a fire successfully because the city did not install a hydrant near the claimant's house. Well, the decision on where to put fire plugs is a discretionary call of the city, not really legislative. Discretionary calls you can't be held liable for. Well, hey, the cop used this kind of force on me, and if you would have bought them the tasers like they asked for, I would just had two Band-Aids. Well, well, that's a discretionary policy level call on how to equip our people. Well, you would have gotten to my house quicker if you had more than two cops on duty. Again, that's a policy level call. We can't be held liable for policy level calls. There's an immunity in the Tort Claims Act for that. Snow or ice, natural conditions on public property or public ways, unless we caused it. You don't get out of the slip and fall on your sidewalk because there was ice all over the sidewalk when it was your sprinklers that were putting all the water on the sidewalk that got the ice there. But when your sprinklers didn't put it there and it just snowed, really, it rained and then got icy, if it was caused by God and not by us, you're not liable. You're not liable for natural conditions on a roadway. In fact, one of my favorite lawsuits that, quite frankly, I could have just settled the damn thing. It was like a $900 claim. A lady that backed, <laughs> went down the street and thought she saw they were closing the road down here because of all this torrential rain and flooding. In fact, they were closing the oncoming lane because if she would have looked to her left, she would have seen that the oncoming lane was flooded out, but since she thought they were putting up barricades for her lane, she decided to back and turn and back into the flooded out roadway and flooded out her car. It's like a $900 claim. One of my adjusters who's now been there several years, it was her first one to go to suit. So I was like, no, we're, we'll defend this. She was right. And sure enough, we were right. Natural condition on a public roadway, we can't be liable for. $40,000 in defense costs later because she had to have been married to one of the craziest human beings in 
Oklahoma, and that's not Matt's opinion, that's also mental health professionals' opinions because the guy was ED'd four times during the case of the lawsuit, and our defense attorney had to get a protective order against him because <laughs> he printed up wanted signs, and that was all fun and games until he went into his neighborhood and started disturbing him around his house, which is why he ended up in the first ED uh, in 14 days, statutory max. That, that was a fun lawsuit. Good old Ron. Good old Ron Wade. The gift that kept on giving for about three years because he just kept, kept on with his lawsuit and there was a brand new district judge who didn't know how to manage her docket. We got filings about every two days in district court. His Facebook page was great to watch though because you could tell when he got committed again. Like after he got out the first time and then said, well, I went up for my court ordered psychological evaluation and when they asked me to fill out the form, I said, if you make me fill out this form, I'm gonna sue you for violating all my rights. And they said, okay, have a good day. And so, ha, I beat the system. And he'd post like 20 times a day. And so you see a couple more posts and then no more posts. 14 days later, he started posting again. So uh, OMAG got sued by him in federal court but we weren't the first defendant. Donald Trump was the first defendant. Governor Stitt was the second. We were about the 40th defendant. Needless to say, we didn't have to do anything in that lawsuit because the federal judge took care of it on his own and realized how crazy Ronnie was. So yeah, we had an immunity. Still cost us a lot of money because people are crazy and he ends up continuing his lawsuit. Lawful entry onto property. You can't be liable in trespass if you can legally enter the property as the government. And we don't have to go through the run, run around uh, on whether or not you should have been there. If you had a lawful right to enter, you're immune from any losses that might result. <clears throat> issuing or not issuing any license or permit. Well, you didn't issue me this like, it, okay, if it starts there because I didn't issue you or I issued a license to somebody else I shouldn't have, then I'm immune. I am immune if I'm, issue, if I'm using my licensing and permitting powers. Inspection powers, including failure to inspect or negligent inspection. You wanna hear somebody be really mad, have a developer who has the city inspector come out to inspect their footing to make sure before they put the, the slab down that they're outside the relative uh, setbacks. And then it comes time for occupancy and they get denied occupancy because the footing was inside the setbacks. Oops, that's a major oops. It's also one we're immune from. If it is inspection powers, by the way, governmental inspection powers, that doesn't mean that we're not liable because, oh, I didn't know the potholes there because I didn't inspect my own streets. It only applies when we're inspecting property as the government, not to inspecting our own property. It's our own property, we don't get out. It's only inspection powers as the government. But if we are negligent in our inspection or we just outright fail to inspect, we're immune from any resulting claim. And developers get really pissed at that. Any injury which is covered by work comp. We, we have a few police vehicles who might smoke somebody who's driving their company vehicle while on duty and they may want to sue us, but they can't. It, not for the bodily injury, the company can sue for the damage to their car. But if the person had work comp coverage that was applicable to their injuries, we're immune. We're immune from, anybody's, from paying for anybody's injuries if they're otherwise covered by work comp. This was added recently, frankly, after the Moore tornado, use of a public facility during an emergency. So if you have storm shelters, you have tornado shelters for the, for the community, those things can get a little hectic when there actually is an emergency. What, there was issues and questions about what kind of liability we could have. Legislature took care of it and said, look, you open your facility to the public during an emergency, you're immune from whatever happens. Dang, that's gone a lot faster. All right, I'm just gonna get past this slide because it's essentially to say, this is all well and good, but if there are factual issues, judges can't resolve that and we end up with juries. And so I can tell you, oh, we shouldn't be liable in this case or that case, but if there's a factual issue and the plaintiff has their own facts, which if true, keep us in the case, we stay in the case. I wanna talk about some examples of the type of claims that we see and give you some ideas of how you can be held liable. The most common claim is what we call negligence which is essentially, I had a legal duty to you, I breached it, and my breach approximately caused you to be injured. Duties are often defined by what's foreseeable. Is it foreseeable that if I'm notwithstanding speed limits, if I'm driving my car down your residential street at 100 miles an hour that I might hit your kid or might hit you? Yeah, 
We are held liable to one another to be responsible when we're doing something that could foreseeably injure somebody. We're going to be held liable to act in a reasonable manner to try and avoid hurting that person. And that's how the court tries to evaluate legal duties. Negligence is an oops. I, one of my favorite videos that I didn't embed in this PowerPoint uh, is a cop that's going up to a house trying to find somebody and needs to ask him some questions. And he's looking and he can see they're sitting there on the couch, but they're so stoned out of their gourd that they can't even hear him knocking on the door. So he starts knocking on the window with his, his flashlight and in the body cam, you could see somebody had, it looked like shot through the window. And so it, our, the window was already compromised. So it was clink, clink, and, and right as it, you hear the glass break, he goes, crap. And I love playing that video because that, that's negligence. It's an oops. It's an accident. We didn't mean to do something. It was just an accident. It's an oops. That's a negligence claim. It's an accidental an accident where we cause somebody to suffer a loss. It is evaluated by what we did. It can also be what we failed to do. How we responded or how we failed to respond. Most critically, what we knew or what we should have known had we been doing our job the way that the court and society thinks we should be doing it. We don't get to hide behind, oh, well, we didn't know if we should have known. I mean, we, we engage in certain actions, and if you're gonna engage in certain actions or certain activities, there are certain things you should be doing if you're gonna be responsible. For example, if you're gonna operate a sewer system, you might wanna keep, make sure the lines are, are, are clear and, and flowing. You want, might, might wanna make sure that you know what quality of lines you have and if there are any that are compromised. We can't just hide behind the veil of saying, oh, we didn't know because we made sure that we wouldn't know. The court's gonna look at it as, what did you know or what should you have known if you had exercised reasonable diligence? And I wanna spend the balance of the day talking about some examples. Slips, trips, and falls. Common claim that we get, sidewalks. Oh my God. The, what people can trip over, I, I love getting the pictures in and it's like less than a millimeter difference between uh, different uh, things of concrete. Not negligent for that. It's what we call a trivial de defect. City Hall, there's a big puddle of water on, on the ground and you knew about it, but everybody kept just walking over it and we'll get to it eventually. And then some little old lady comes in to pay her bill and slips and falls and breaks her hip. Yeah, we're gonna be responsible for that. <coughs> now, are we responsible the first second that that water tank blew and, and the water got out there? No, we can't be, it's not strict liability. We have to actually not be reasonable. How long was it there? When did we know or should have known about it? Did we respond reasonably? If we saw that thing burst and we were running to go get the cones and somebody slipped and fell on it, okay, you weren't negligent there. If we looked at it though and said, we'll get to it later, we're gonna be held liable. I'm not, I'm not gonna look at Jason. I'm not gonna look at Jason, potholes. <laughs> he's trying, he, he's really trying. He kinda needs his help from his community. Uh, to, to get behind you on this. Piedmont's got some pothole issues because Piedmont grew really quick and, and didn't have the infrastructure to, to, to get there. And that's what Jason inherited. So they've unfortunately become the pothole capital of Oklahoma. Um, potholes are about what we knew and what we didn't know. If we, you know, you have a pothole that develops that first second it developed, you're not gonna be liable. You didn't know about it. But at some point in time, you are gonna know about it. At some point in time, you're gonna know or should have known about it. And we're not gonna to get to the slides because this has gone longer than I actually expected. But one of the questions I had later in the slides is, okay, it's not what the street department knew. We've got cops out there who hopefully are driving the streets on a frequent basis. We know we've got sanitation drivers who are going through the streets at least once a week. It's about what the city knows and we don't get to hide behind the street department didn't know that there was a pothole that had reformed in this place. If other city employees would have known, it's the city's knowledge. So potholes are about when one forms, did we know or should we reasonably have known? Did we respond in a reasonable manner? Jason's got his issue of he's got a funding gap here that he can't just, you know, magically make, uh, uh, can't magically fill. So they're doing the best they can to deal with the infrastructure that he inherited. And I did love that KFOR story as they're going out there trying to make him look as bad as possible. Jason's got the road crew out there tearing up the road to replace it. And at least tabloid, I mean, KFOR news uh, included that part of the story. I didn't call them tabloid news on camera. They are. Um, potholes, what do we know? Did we respond in a reasonable manner? Utility line strikes. Did we call Oki? Did we get the markings out there? There's, there's a lot of them that we don't. And, and this is where I'm going to use the opportunity, since we won't get to the later slides, to say 
please have your people take a picture. Please. If we're digging and we called Oki and they came out and marked, take a couple pictures. Everybody's got a high definition camera in their pocket. Take a couple pictures because guess what we can't see after we've already turned dirt? Can't see where all the markings were or where they weren't. Because AT&T will tell their, their uh, adjusters all the time, oh yeah, we marked it properly. The ones that we have pictures, I'm telling you, about six and 10 times, we don't pay anything because the people that they have doing their markings, they don't mark them or they don't mark them correctly. But if we don't have that evidence, we can't see where the markings were. It's a he said, she said. Take a picture of, after you've called Oki before you turn dirt, just take a quick picture of where the markings were. So we can see where did you dig, where, the, where were the markings. Water line disconnects. If we say we're gonna turn somebody's water off, especially before an epic winter storm, especially before an epic winter storm, let's do it. Because you'd be amazed how many times that, yeah, we go back out there and the meter lid was locked. And when we unlock it, we find, yeah, that's on full on. And yeah, we had electronic readers and they didn't have any water usage because they weren't in the house until right about this time, which is when the pipe bursts. And my favorite on those is when we send them a bill for it. And they get a bill for the thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons that ran through their pipes after they burst because we didn't turn off the water. If we, we don't have a duty to turn it off, but if we tell them we'll turn it off for them because they're leaving and they wanna make sure their lines don't burst while they're gone, we have a duty to do so. We've taken on that duty to do so. Auto accidents, how do we operate the car? Distracted driving, going too fast, going too slow. You wanna know how we're actually, what we're actually doing? Can we please stop backing into things? No. Please stop backing into things, please. This is literally like a full legit over quarter of the liability claims we get is us backing into other people's cars. The, our risk management guys will come out and tell you first motion forward, back into your spots so that the first thing you do as you're going forward and, and starting to maybe not pay attention or let the coffee kick in is at least you're going forward where you can see. Please stop backing into things. Please tell your employees to stop backing into things or do something to make them pay attention when they're going or buy them the damn reverse cameras because those things actually do help. We had a, there's a school pool up in Washington who cut their claims. I mean, God, what was it, Susie? They, they spent maybe 20% of what their annual claims were on backing claims, buying just reverse cameras for all their school buses. Their claims went down like 60% the next year. They're not, if we're not gonna pay attention while backing up, at least give us a camera so that we can see. Can we please stop hitting things that aren't moving? Like park cars, <laughs> mailboxes, please. This is like 20% of our claims on a year and year, year over basis. And this is liability claims, because keep in mind, every liability claim that we have, we also were paying money to repair the city vehicle. And, and on that note, can y'all please get some better hunters to take care of the deer? Because the number of deer that we kill or try to kill us in a given year, I mean, we have an entire loss code just for deer on city violence. Because um, that, that's one of our major causes of loss. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you on our first party side is either we hit a deer or a deer hits us. And, and Apparently not if you're driving a Tahoe. <laughs> My, what, you know, the first time after I became claims director, the first time I saw deer hit car, I was like, okay, no, somebody's playing a joke here. We struck the deer and we just don't want to. No, it's damage to the, the passenger side door of a car on a state highway. Damn, that deer's quick, <laughs> just not quick enough. Can you please get your cops to drive better? They're a third of our auto liability claims and half of our damages are cops. And, and by the way, what, what does everybody think? Oh, well, yeah, but they, they get in pursuits and you know high speed, high risk. That's not it because there's actually a statute that says we can't be held liable in negligence if we are running lights and sirens. Or actually it says lights or sirens in response to an emergency call. They actually do really well when they're running lights and sirens. Most of the claims we get are when somebody doesn't pay attention and actually turns into them and then thinks they have a claim. And we say they don't because of the statute. This is when they're not running code. This is when they're just driving around. One of my favorite claims, and, and it's kind of sick, but we got a claim in. A Oklahoma County area, area agency, even though it's all public record, had just dropped a prisoner off at Oklahoma County was heading back to their city and the sun was in their eyes and so they couldn't see the 85 year old man that was walking across the crosswalk as they turned and 
he needed a new hip. He did. We bought him a new hip. And we bought him a new hip because when we first saw it, it was, okay, well, how do we evaluate this? Because, you know, the sun in the eyes. And, and he was walking against it because clearly they had the green arrow. And we looked at the body cam. Yeah, the sun was pretty bright. And you can see him starting to walk across because he, he had the little man, as I tell my daughter, wait for the little man before you start walking. He had the little man, but he was so slow because he was old and, and already disabled that the little man turned red before, and our light turned green, and we could watch as he saw the green light, and so he started turning and turned, I mean, just right there in the body cam. Could see it clear as day, and we could also see him playing with the cell phone. So we told the attorney, where do we mail the 125 check? We, 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 we can, we'll handle it, deliver it if you want. On that note, your people know who their bad drivers are and their distracted drivers. If your people know, oh, that's the guy, that's Bob, he's, he's the one that never pays attention, please deal with it. Please deal with it. Make Bob a better driver or make Bob not be a driver anymore because you'd be amazed how many of these claims we see repeat drivers. that The officer from the agency that shall not be named, in addition to smoking that guy, he's totaled out three vehicles. We bought them three new vehicles thanks to this one driver and he's had several other li auto liability claims, and he's still employed. Nothing's ever happened to him. When your people make a mistake, doesn't mean you have to fire them for making a mistake, but, but start taking some corrective action because we see a lot of repeat drivers, and that's not good. Sometimes we mow rocks through cars or people. Um, do you have guards on your mowers when you're out there because, I mean, Mistakes do happen sometimes, but if we don't have guards on the mowers, we're probably going to end up paying the claim. I'm not repeating that on the recording. Uh, sewer backups are really sucking right now. And, and I mean, really, really bad. Like our losses have increased to an order of magnitude of approaching about eight right now. We're talking about things that used to cost us on a given year four to five hundred thousand dollars, now costing us three million dollars plus a year. And it's all because of one attorney who's figured out how to game the system. And by the way, these are not cases you want to try to a jury, because jury dinged Oklahoma City for four hundred thousand dollars after being told they could only do fifty thousand dollars for two houses, twenty-five each. Still came back with four hundred thousand. They dinged us for two. What was it, Susie? Two twenty-eight. Two twenty-one. They dinged us for 400. And I think the aggregate time that all three juries were out would probably be less than two hours, maybe two and a half hours. These cases are, are crappy. The, yes, yes, bad joke. Really and truly, if I can tell you one thing, do you have a plan? Do you have equipment for your people that is commensurate with the kind of operation that you're operating, i.e. your general fund budget? Are your people using the equipment? Do we know where our problem lines are? Do we have a plan to address it? The reason that these cities are getting dinged is because they do a decent job of making a jury feel like, I mean, look, who's testifying? It's the guys from line maintenance, the guys from the sewer department. It's Bubba. It's not who the public is gonna think, my God, with this kind of exposure to me and this could happen to me, is that who I really want taken care of? But well, nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. You're not gonna get somebody, I mean, I hate to say it, you're not gonna get somebody like me who wants to spend all day in sewage, do we have a plan? Do they actually know where the problems are and are we doing something to try and address them? Are we doing preventative maintenance? Do we know where the root problems are? Have we tried to do any sort of study, including smoke testing, to figure out where our bad lines are that are causing rainwater to get into our lines? I'm not a smart guy when it comes to this, but the smart people tell me 80% of that rainwater that gets into the system after a heavy rain event and ends up overcharging the lines and causing a backup is coming from 20% of our lines which means if we can replace just 20% of our lines, we can frankly get rid of most of our sewer backup issues because the vast majority of our sewer backup claims start with rain. Rain then contributes and then we got stuff that's in the line that then gets held up on roots that are in the line, which by the way could be dealt with with just a routine treatment that doesn't cost all that much money. Contact us, we'll, we'll put you in touch with Duke's Roots. They do a good job and they warranty their work for a pretty good amount of time afterwards. These are becoming huge claims to the point of something's got to give here because it's getting completely out of control. Where are we at? 47. 
false rest, that's, we, we don't need to go over that. Termination, we'll deal with that stuff later. All right, help us to help you. Please send us the claim as soon as you get it. Now, it doesn't mean if you get it at 4.59 that you gotta stay late, to, but send it to us the first thing in the morning. We have had instances where we're getting the claim two, four, even six weeks after it was received, and that's when it finally gets over to us. Well, remember, there's only 90 days before your sovereign immunity is waived. The sooner we get it, the more of the, that 90 days we have to try and protect you and get the case resolved if it needs to get resolved. So send it to us as soon as you can. Please don't deny the claim before you send it to us. And that may not seem like something I should have to say, but multiple cities have done this to us where we get the claim and we get the copy of the express denial that they, they sent because they waited to do that until they sent it to us. And what's really great is when you get an angry call from a city clerk because suit gets filed and they want to know why we didn't settle it. We can't talk to the claimant after the 90 days runs or it's expressly denied or we can cause some issues legally. So we investigate the claim from the city side, but only the city side. And if it's not clear liability, we never talk to the claimant. So there's nothing like getting a call from a clerk who express denies a claim and then sends it to you and then gets pissed when you didn't contact the claimant to settle it. Please don't deny it before you send it to us. They'll be denied by statute. Preserve records. When you know that you've got a loss, when you know somebody got hurt, maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but somebody slipped and fell in city hall and hurt themselves, go ahead and save some records related to that. And, and by the way, when we're dealing with accidents, I, I try and hammer this into my adjuster's heads, our cops respond on our auto accidents. It doesn't have to be a police auto accident. It could be a sanitation or public works auto accident. Cops typically will respond to that and do an accident report. Sometimes they'll do an accident report saying we're, we're at fault when actually we legally weren't. And we can have a conversation with your chiefs about that because you've had some conversations with cops about why'd you say they were at fault? Well, uh, I, I've really got to get back to my shift. Uh, dude, you're killing me here. <laughs> like, I'd get it if we were actually liable. Body and dash cam. Because guess what? You know how many times you get into a fender bender and everybody's all right, and then six months later when they've gotten to an attorney, all of a sudden their back hurts and, and they can't move and they've got to have hundreds of thousands of dollars of surgeries? You know what's really good for us if we have to go to, in front of a jury? Is that body cam that shows that they were fine, didn't want medical attention, everything's good? Or, my favorite, maybe shows that somebody wasn't there who now claims to have been in the car. Try and hammer all my adjusters because you know your police department's only going to retain those videos for a certain amount of time. That's fine, the police department can have its own retention on routine calls like that. You should be investigating every accident that your people are involved in, and that would include, forget about for our purposes, for your purposes, if you're investigating an accident for internal purposes, ask the police to give, them, give you their video so you can take a look at it. And then if you could save that for the year, that would be super, because I'd like to have it. Set aside time to, to work with us on the claim. This is usually a problem in smaller communities where there are limited resources and a limited number of people. I can't tell you how many claim files I have to look at to where it's call after call after call after call after call after call, trying to get the public works people on the phone to talk about the sewer backup so that we can figure out what we knew or didn't know. And we can't get a call back because their time is valuable. So is the claim. So we're not unreasonable. It, it's not always gonna be the best time to talk to us. Let's set aside a time to be able to talk because there are numerous, numerous instances at big and small cities where we're knocking on the door of 90 days and we have been trying to get a city driver or city employee on the, on the phone and, and all of our uh, efforts are going unresponded to. Document, document, document. Now I'll tell you my rule. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. And once it's in writing, you own it. So one of my favorite employment claims that I, got to defend for about two seconds through OMAD because they settled it, was a city who a bad employee left and they popped champagne and then he applied to come back to the city in a new position and they didn't want him back because he was a crappy employee. But instead of telling him, no, we're not considering you because you're a crappy employee, they said it's because of his disability. In writing, <laughs> I mean, it's, you gotta have a sense of humor. John Woods did not have a sense of humor about that, but I had a sense of humor. I knew I wasn't gonna get paid very much because that one was gonna get settled right away but document, but just remember, once it's in writing, it, it, it's forever. Do you document when people, does your public works, for example, document when people call in about sewer issues, sewer flow issues, potholes, utility line, or utility disconnects, line breaks? Do we document when we get those calls? Do we document 
what we did in response to it. Who went out? When did they go out? What did they do? You'd be amazed at how many times we go out or, or we get a, like a sewer backup and, and we call the public works folks and they're like, yeah, well, see what happened was he called on this day and then I'm okay, can you send me your work order? Well, well no, we don't have those. Now, that's all well and good because their memory is pretty good when we get the tort claim within a couple months. When we get the tort claim at the one year mark, hell, I don't know. I don't remember if that, my favorite is, I don't remember if that was this backup or it was the other backup he had, or maybe it was the other backup that he had, but we didn't have notice of any sewer issues at his house. My favorite is our sewer questionnaire where you know talks about prior issues on the line and we've got one particular city who thank goodness the person has gone to retirement because they would send us back that form, no notice, no prior issues. We're working the fourth claim on this guy's house and we've got four other claims from that street and you're telling me there's no notice on this? Are you just, are you even paying attention? Documentation is great. Contemporaneous documentation is great. It helps with memory and it helps in cases to be able to show, look, we, we have a system in place to take complaints and we have a system that tells us how we respond so that it's not he said, she said. We've got some extra documentation. It's not going to get us uh, avoid a jury because they can still say something different. But it's nice to have that documentation and be able to show we didn't just write it up for you. We write it up for everybody. This is the process we follow. As I said, everybody's got a high definition camera in their pocket. Maybe we could use them. Like for example, somebody gets hurt on our property. Do we take a picture of what it looked like in the moment? When we damage somebody else's property, do we take a picture? Do we gather statements? Be amazed how many times we get the claim in and nothing. There, there's been a couple auto claims where it was a minor fender bender, especially based on our appraisal of the city's vehicle, but all of a sudden their vehicle's got a whole lot of damage on it. It would have been nice to have had a picture of what the damage we caused was, and at, at this point in time, everybody's got a camera in their pocket. Calling Oki, take a picture of the markings. When we do a street cut and we put a barricade out, do we take a picture of the barricade? Because you'd be amazed how many of those things just walk away. Or, or you might be amazed, uh, one of my favorite claims that our defense attorney dubbed the Dukes of Hazard claim because City had done a full on street cut and it was pretty deep and they had a nice big gravel pile sitting right next to it, which was a nice position because you had the street cut, you had the gravel pile and you had the lane of traffic. Now they had all the cones out and magically the cones that would have been right in front of our driver who had just driven past the construction to go to the bar uh, and was driving back and the cones had magically disappeared and she went over the gravel pile and then busted her sternum when she went into the hole. And I was so incredibly angry at their police department and their police officer because when he responded, her family had gotten there first and put her in the car and did everything they could to get him from talking to her because she was drunk. And I bet if he had popped the hood or popped the trunk, he would have found the two cones sitting in her trunk. But we got to... Uh, almost go to trial on that one before we got it resolved because factual issues, we didn't have any documentation of the barricades being, or the cones being there. Kind of made sense that they would have been because there was a nice little line until you got this one little gap, but taking pictures will show that actually we did do this and here's what it looked like. I don't say this because I'm trying to screw anybody over. Please don't admit liability. I'm not saying that because, oh, we're gonna pull some game on, on these people. No, we, we pay the claims we owe and we'll pay them promptly. Whether you say you owe it or not doesn't mean you're legally liable. It sets an expectation. We shouldn't set expectations for our constituents that aren't realistic. We know what we're doing. We've got good claims adjusters and we've got four attorneys who can help the claims adjusters do a legal analysis and liability analysis. And one of the things I continue to tell my adjusters is, don't tell claimants that the city wasn't responsible for their loss. Tell them they weren't legally liable because there is a difference between that ain't right and you're legally liable. There are things that don't seem right that we cannot be held liable for that we just aren't right, that people don't think is right. And there are things I don't think are right that we're still not legally liable for. Leave that to us. If we owe it, I promise you we'll pay it and we'll pay it promptly. It would help if your people tell us the truth, by the way, because there's nothing like, and I can't say the name, but we have a saying that is a city employee's name in the office because during the claim investigation, adamant, told us this, told us this, told us this, Small claims action comes out. Susie actually goes out to do it herself. He gets on the stand, completely says the opposite. Be amazed what people will say when you actually have to swear an oath. So, and by the way, if you have a question about why we denied a claim, we'll tell you. We'll tell you everything that we had. 
I mean, but we're, we have nothing to hide here. We'll tell you what our evaluation was, what your employees told us. And there have been a couple of times where cities asked why we denied a claim. We told them what the employees said. And they went, really? They told you that? Well, that's interesting because that's not what they told me. You want to know what, what we found during our investigation? We don't have anything to hide from you. We won't. Our files aren't open to anybody else, but we'll, we'll share with you what we got. Communicate, and this is a whole lot of words to get to. We're all one city. It doesn't matter if the street department didn't know. It doesn't matter if city hall staff didn't know about the water that was spilled. Street department didn't know about this. Parks didn't know about this. If the city knew because a city employee knew, no matter what department they're in, then the city knows, and we're charged with that knowledge. Do, do, do your police officers notify streets of new potholes that come up? Do they notify the sewer about manholes who pop out or notify uh, the water department about water meter can lids that are out? Do they notify or any of the employees who are out at the city parks notify when there's some hazard that's out there? A lot of city employees think they just work in this lane and they don't, it's not their responsibility, not my circus, not my monkeys. You know what? We're one city. We're not a street department. We're not a water department. We're not a parks department. Legally, we're a city. And so if our employees aren't telling the right departments, if we don't tell our employees you have to report when you see dangerous things, just because it's not within your purview doesn't mean you don't report it, you end up being charged with having that knowledge. And we end up owing the claim. Let's see, what else did I have here? Have a plan, sewer, please have an accurate map. We have big cities. Who, one of my favorite claims was one for a fairly large city. It's a sewer backup looking at the house and I'm looking at the sewer map going, how does this guy tie in? There's, there's not a service line within in, in his area. So we got another map and they'd taken a blue pen and had drawn a new line that, that was on there that wasn't on the actual map. They just had never actually put it on there. Do we have accurate maps? Do we have an actual preventive maintenance program? Do we know which lines are problematic? Are we doing something about it? These are all things that can help us in litigation be able to show we're actually trying to deal with our issues. It can't be dealt with overnight, but here is the plan that we have in place. Potholes, you're gonna have different level of problems with your streets. Do we have a list of priority streets in an order of priority and an effort to get secure funding to be able to start replacing them? We may not get to the fifth problem street because we're trying to get to one, two, three, and four first. Being able to show that we, it's not that we're doing nothing, we've got a plan, funding is limited, here's what we're doing to try and actually solve the problem. Potholes. Ah, employees. I think this is actually the last slide. So since I went through at warp speed here at the end, I can actually say I finished it. Bottom line when it comes to employees, do we communicate honestly? Do we deal with the problem employees? Do we deal with poor performance and document? Do we deal with misconduct and document? Do we on a somewhat regular basis evaluate their performance and tell them the good and the bad? Be honest with them. I cannot tell you how miserable it is as an attorney to present somebody who's a department head who wants to testify how much of a bad employee this guy's been for years. And you know what happens when they say that? Cross-examination, plaintiff's attorney. Okay, I'm gonna mark this as plaintiff's exhibit one. Do you recognize this? Yeah, it's an employee evaluation. Is that your signature at the bottom? Yes, it is. Was it from the year before they were fired? Yes, it was. How'd you mark them? Above average. Exhibit number two, was this from two years? Exhibit number three, exhibit number four, exhibit number five. Two things with that. One, it sucks for the attorneys here to have to try and defend that. Number two, we're not being honest with the employees. If we're only giving them the good and we're not giving them the bad, are they ever going to improve? We got to be honest with our employees. We got to document because there's nothing worse than trying to fire somebody and not having any documentation of performance issues, misconduct, no evaluations even. Please be honest with them. A lot of the problems that we deal with, especially like auto accidents, like I said, a lot of city drivers, no discipline comes out of their accident even when they're grossly at fault. Deal with your problems. Deal with your problems, document it, don't go overboard, but deal with them. Deal with them in a reasonable manner. We're all here to do the best thing that we can for our community. I know this part of it is not the most pleasant to have to deal with the employee side of it, but the bottom line is it's public money that's paying their salary. They're here to deliver for the public. If they're not delivering for the public, why are we paying them? We need to all be held to that standard.